and join me in welcoming this guy. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Cindy Burgess. Um, I really love what God is doing here at the Father's House. And I am excited for what God's doing this summer. And I'm so glad you guys are here because I really believe that God has a word for you. We are going to continue our all-in series. This is that study we've been doing where we're looking at specific moments in the scripture where people that have been following God go from kind of halfway to all-in. And, uh, and so we started this last week. And it's, I didn't plan it this way, but it's going to end up being a three-parter called Welcome Home. We're going to be looking in uh, Zechariah and Haggai, and we're going to be looking at how God stirred up a group of people that had kind of given up, and how he took them from being halfway to all in for what God was calling him to do. And so if you guys want to follow along, we have paper notes on these metal tables here, or you can follow along on our free Father's House app. But we started out last week um, by sharing a, kind of a funny story about when we went to vacation in, in Oahu. We were house-sitting for some friends in Kaneohe Bay, and we had to spend our first two hours there in paradise running after a very nervous, uh, frustrating dog that we finally were able to come home, and we were finally able to have um, our, our poke bowls. And so after we ate and we're all full and we're all happy and the dog is safe, we're like, okay, guys, first day in Hawaii, what do you want to do? Now, don't worry. Don't worry. I know you guys, the last thing anyone wants to see is someone else's vacation pictures. Don't worry. I'm not going to I'm not gonna do that to you guys. But this is what we wanted to do. The, the, everyone is like, let's go send it off of China Walls. And that, if you're not familiar with Oahu, that's on the east side of the island in Hawaii Kai. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You go to this wall and you jump off of it. In fact, I think we have some pictures. Yeah, there, there's the boys just they come on, coming up with all kinds of creative ways to wait for the wave to come, and then you jump off. And, you know, Cindy and I, we've, we've raised five boys. Adventure, that's what Hawaii was so great because there's adventure around every corner. And so they were just sending it, just loving this time. Now, Ben, my thirdborn, he was just up here playing the bass. And uh, so, you know, he's fine before I tell this story. Um, that should tell you something. So he's looking at his brother is sending it off, doing front flips, side flips, all of that kind of stuff. And he's and they're all yelling from the water, Ben, Ben, do a front flip, do a front flip. And I'm looking at him, and the dad, you know, the dad kind of look at him like, hey, Ben, if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to do it. And he's looking at me, but then all the brothers, come on, man, you got to do this. And he's looking at me, and I'm like, Ben, it's okay. You can just jump in, totally fine. So he's going back and forth, and then I could see the resolve on his face, right? This was a resolve of a, of a boy who was going to be all in. And so he starts running, and this is what happens next. Oh! 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 <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Oh! 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 Stop, 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 stop. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Um, I don't know if you could hear the slap. But the slap was pretty loud when you were standing there. And so my poor son, he, he, you know, rotated too far, and he was all in. The problem was so was his face on the, the, the surface of that water, which felt something like hitting concrete um, at, the, at the pace and, and the speed at which he was going. And so, of course, having raised five boys, concussions are, you know, I hate to say kind of a common occurrence around our house, we take them seriously, don't worry, but, but they happen a lot. And so we're just looking at him, we're like, you know, studying the signs, is he, okay, he came up out of the water, that's the, so far so good. Um, he's swimming around, he's laughing about, uh, you know, and so we're like, oh, I guess, I guess it wasn't as hard as it looked or sounded. He crawls up out of the, the cliff and, and he's standing up there, and I look over at him and all of a sudden like there's this like glazed look and, and he's, he's just kind of like looking off into the sky and I'm like, hey, Ben, Ben, what, what's going on? And he, he looks at me and he kind of looks around, what am I doing here? Oh, no. Oh, no. He's like, where, where am I? Why are we at China Walls? And I'm like, Ben, 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 come, come sit over here. Come sit over here. So I had him sit on the rock, and I'm like, Cindy, come over here. Looks like we've got another case of the concussions. 
And so, you know, he, she comes over and, you know, his eyes are dilated, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. All the boys see that something's wrong with Ben. They all climb out, you know, because they've all had concussions, breaks, injuries, sprains, all of them. They all feel like they're absolutely certified experts on how to ascertain, you know, how bad this is. And they're just pestering him with questions like, Ben, are you okay? And Ben, the, ben doesn't remember how he got there. He doesn't remember having just met a friend uh, there at China Walls before he flipped off and, and it was just, you know, we could see that, okay, he's, he's, he's got a concussion here, but I think it's going to be okay. You know, everyone was caring for him. One of his family members was like, Ben, do you realize we've already been here a week? And he was like, what? And, and they were like, no, no, just kidding. You've only been here a day, which was so mean. And it was me. I'll just go. I'll just go. <laughs> I know, you guys are like, what kind of horrible pastor are you? Making fun of your son with a concussion, but I'm telling you, it was hilarious. Um, but he was fine, everything was fine. His memory, even as we were walking away, it's bits and pieces started to come back. And eventually he was able to, as he laid low for the next two days, he was able to enjoy the rest of his trip. The reason why I'm sharing that with you is not only because that first day in Hawaii was pretty rough. But it was also, you know, it wasn't going to impede what it is that God has for us. I don't know how your first half of 2023 was. Maybe it was really awesome and you've never felt closer to God. Or maybe it was kind of rough and you were trying to be all in, you know, with your, like, your, your New Year's resolutions and you're like, Ben, like, yeah, we're going to go. And then you just did a full-on face plant. And, and ever since you have kind of been skittish, about following through with some of the things that God has asked you to do. And you've experienced what I've called <laughs> a kind of, not amnesia, but just you've forgotten what it is that God has for you, what it is he's called you to do, a Christian concussion. We've hit hard, some of us, some experiences where we're just trying to obey God, and life has smacked us in the head. And we're kind of dazed and confused like Ben was on that day. Like, how did I get here? Why am I here? What happened? And I think this is a really good time at the halfway point of 2023 for God to restore your memory. For God to speak purpose through his spirit back into who you are. Because this is very much where the people of God were. If you weren't here last week, let me just give you a quick refresher. After 70 years in captivity, the people of Israel were finally released from Babylon. God moved on the evil King Cyrus's heart and sent God's people back. 50,000 people led by Zerubbabel and by Joshua. They were going back to rebuild the temple. And everybody, like Ben, was all in. They, they were like, finally, we get to rebuild the temple. We get to have a place of worship. We get to leave this pagan land. And they just sent it right off the edge. Yeah. Twelve years in, construction had completely stopped. They were only halfway done with the temple. They'd run into resistance from the people in the lands around them that did not want to see the people of Israel restored. They'd run out of resources. They'd run out of energy. They'd run out of time. They'd run out of patience. They ran out, and they experienced a concussion. They ran hard into all of these problems and are basically like, well, if God had called us to do this, it shouldn't be this hard. Has any of you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that if there's resistance, it means I've missed this? When it could be the exact opposite? You're experiencing resistance because you're right on target? You're doing exactly what it is that God's called you to do? So right around that point, um, unlike me who, you know, was making fun of my son, we get some really good prophets coming in. Haggai and Zechariah, and they're coming in and they're speaking to him. And we kicked off last week's message but with that powerful word that you've heard a million times, probably so much that it doesn't even carry the weight it should. But he says to this group of despondent, depressed, discouraged people, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Do not despise the small beginnings. And some of us need to hear that word at this kind of marker in our year. Before we step into the next year, some of you guys are like, I'm not, I'm not going to be all in again. I, that hurt too much last time. Some of you guys have even forgotten 
why you're here, why you are the church, why God has you living in California, why you're a part of the Father's house. And I'm praying that God would restore, that he would speak into you, that a God-sized purpose is only possible through a God-sized power. And that's through his spirit. Let's come in that place today. God, we just thank you. God, for this moment to stop and to learn from your word. By your spirit that is moving in us this halfway point of 2023, God, we want to just stop and reflect and go, God, are we, are we all in? Or because of hurt and pain and frustrations and struggles, God, have we kind of backed away from our God-given purpose? God, have we put one foot in and one foot out? Holy Spirit, in the same way where you stirred up the hearts of the people of Israel to get off the bench and back on the field. God, we're leaning in in this halftime to what our coach is saying. We just ask, God, that you would awaken that call in us, that you would remind us of what it is that we've forgotten. And Holy Spirit, that you would stir in us a heart to do exactly what you've called us to do in the second half of 2023. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So you understand that we're using this uh, kind of welcome home idea of the three rooms, the dining room. We talked about it last week. If you didn't get a chance to hear that message, you can catch it on our, our YouTube channel. But we're looking at the dining room and the family room and my favorite room, the kitchen. And so last week we looked at the dining room, which is where normally this is what happens on a Sunday, either here or with our kids. This is where a lot of people will connect with Christ initially. When you're inviting a coworker, a friend, or a family member, typically you'll invite them to come to a service on a Sunday. That's the, the dining room. And just like you would have somebody that you're getting to know come to your house, you set up a presentation, hopefully some really good food, and you're just serving them. That's what our heart is here to do. We take second on Sundays so that people can see Christ first. And so many of you volunteer in various ways and serve to make this dining room experience something that helps people to connect with Christ. But we don't stay in that room, right? After you're done eating the meal, we go typically after a big meal, we go sit and invite our guests into the family room. And the family room is usually filled with, you know, couches and big chairs and pillows. And it's a little more of a comfy scenario, something where you can let down your guard, maybe even loosen your belt a little bit because you shouldn't have that second helping of pie, but you did anyways because it was so good. And this is where you move from like a more formal setting to something that's a little more casual and you get to know people a little bit better. That is what we're calling the family room and that typically does not happen on a Sunday. It typically happens every other day of the week. The dining room is where we connect with Christ, but the family room is where we connect through community because you and I were created for community. It's one of the reasons why we're sitting around tables just for the month of July. I know some of you guys are like, why are we sitting around tables? Right, the extroverts among us, they're like, yes, a chance to talk to people. The introverts among us are like, oh, i got to talk to people. Right, either way, you know, maybe, maybe you're somewhere in between. Don't worry, you will not be forced to say anything. You don't have to share your deep, dark secrets. You don't have to pray anything. You can literally just sit there. But one thing we just want you to understand in a very visceral, visible way is that you're seen, you are heard, and you're a part of what God is doing here at the Father's house. And a table kind of breaks down those barriers. It's a lot easier to get to know somebody when you're looking at them instead of the back of their head. So it's just a temporary thing, but I'm hoping that you're able to lean into it and learn what God has for you out of it. But the family room is this opportunity for us to be reminded of where I think we've experienced a major Christian concussion. We've forgotten who we are, most because of people like me in my position. I have, whether intentionally or unintentionally, modeled for you that it's the job of the professional to bring the word across and to help people connect with Christ and to build community. This has caused in the American church primarily for people to come in a more passive way where they show up on a Sunday, they come and receive whatever it has been prepared, and then they think that that hour and 15 minutes or so is the extent of their Christian expression, and then the rest of what they're doing for the rest of the week largely is not even remotely connected to what it is that we've been talking about or saying here on a Sunday. And if that remains remains true, then all I'm doing is wasting your time, but I'm also misrepresenting the way God set it up to be. 
Because you know people that I don't know. And I know people that you don't know in your circles of influence. And there's a lot of people that we know that are not around these tables because they could never see themselves in a place like this, but they could definitely see themselves hanging out with you in a family room setting because they like you, they just don't like the church. Now you see how important your role is. And my goal, my prayer this morning is that wherever you've received a Christian concussion, wherever you've hit hard into maybe situations where you feel like, oh, that's not my job, that's their job, I just want to remind you, re-encourage you, ask God that would fill you with his spirit like he's about to do with God's people through this prophetic word to say, no, God has put you where you're at on purpose by divine design. The people that you know will know Christ, and not because of me, but because you fulfill your divine role in your circles of influence. Look at this in Haggai 1. Here's the prophet Haggai showing up to a group of despondent Israelites that have all given up on the temple. Remember last week he said, I want you guys to go up to the mountain. I want you to grab a plank and some wood, and we're going to start building this thing together. Everybody has a job. Everybody has a place. Everyone has a role and a responsibility in the dining room. But look what happens in the family room. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Wow. This is the, so much here. One of the things we're going to be leaning into in our next sermon series is how to hear the voice of God. Because you've probably been frustrated by hearing guys like me going, oh, yeah, and then God told me. Oh, yeah, and then God said. And you're going, how does that even work? Like, are you hearing him out loud? Is it like, is, is it, John, you will go and do this. No, most of the time it isn't. But most of the time where I'm not doing a great job equipping you on how to hear the voice of the Lord. So our whole next series starting next month is going to be learning to hear the voice of the Lord. Because this is exactly what happens when we do. When you understand that God isn't just speaking to me, but he's speaking to you. And that God not only wants to speak to you, but he wants to speak through you to the world around you. That's when the church becomes unstoppable. That's when we're no longer limiting the expression of a church to an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday morning. But then the church, you, gets to go out and be walking out through obedience what God has asked you to do. There's things that sometimes I'll share with you that God's asking me to do just in my sermon. But there's a lot of stuff I don't know what God's asked you to do. Only you know if you're actually following through on what God's asked you to do. But when you do, oh my goodness. We create an atmosphere where people can connect with Christ outside of a Sunday morning service. And it becomes powerful and beautiful. And that's exactly what's going on here. The people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. So my question to you, quite pointedly, is are you obeying what God's asked you to do? Or maybe because of a Christian concussion, maybe because you've hit hard on some things lately, you've kind of forgotten. And my prayer is that God would remind you why you're here. So the spirit of the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the spirit of Joshua, the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. This is so powerful. This is a very unique collaboration it's kind of almost like a, a pre-picture of what the church is going to be in Acts chapter 2. Because we're seeing the prophetic, right, Haggai and Zechariah. We're seeing the priestly. We're seeing the political leaders. And we're seeing the people. All of them. All the levels of Israel all working together, moving as one, obeying what it is that God's called them to do. Because the Spirit of God is stirring up inside of them their own personal responsibility to carry out the call of God on them, so it's both individual and corporate obedience. And I, I just I, that's what I'm praying will happen here. As God welcomes us home, that we would understand it's also our job to welcome others home into the presence of God. Speaking of welcoming home, I, when we first came here um, in, two, in 2020, we couldn't even meet together because of gathering guidelines. COVID had just started, and so we had 10 house churches where people were gathering and, and uh, we were watching the video online and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we just started meeting out in the parking lot. 
But I love that that's how our church started because it was like the Lord was saying, hey, this new chapter, um, I, I just want to remind you that the church is not an address. The church is not a location. The church is not the name on a building. The church is the presence of God and the people of God walking out the purposes of God in the world around us. And for a time, a short time, I think the church actually returned to what we were originally meant to be. Because as soon as things started letting up, guidelines started coming, you know, everybody, everybody's like, oh, I don't have to open up my home anymore? That's great. I'm just going to come to church. Let someone else do the stuff. It's a lot easier to just show up. And don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm glad you guys are. But my goodness, if we reduce the expression of our Christian leadership and the culture around us to just showing up, and letting someone else be, devour the word and share the word, use their gifts, we're missing out on what God's called us to do. It reminds me of my first conversation with, with Kirk and Kim Henson. Kirk is on our council. Kim leads our women's uh, ministry. Uh, Camille is actually back there uh, as our youth pastor working the, the tech, tech room back there. I love, how, I love how God works stuff. Camille's our youth pastor, but when she was only two years old, this church started in her home. How amazing is that? Dan and Tracy Doherty, who started this church, pastored it so faithfully, they approached Kirk and Kim, and they were telling us this story when we first met with them, and they, were, they said, hey, your home is perfect. We don't have a place to meet. Can we start our first house church in, in your home? And I love just, I love Kirk's honesty. He, Kim's like, yeah, let's go for it. You know, and, and Kirk's like, um, honey, let's, let, let's talk. Um, if, if it's in our home, I can't sleep in. If the church is in our home, I can't stay in my pajamas. If the church is in our home, I have to get up and, like, open the door. Right, and I just I loved his honesty because I, those things, those those obligations of responsibility that were on Kirk's heart before he opens his home are the same things that you and I have to work through every single time. Right, it's a lot easier to just let it be a church expression on a Sunday morning. It's much harder to open up our home and and invite people in and and you know prepare a lesson or just, you know, even having people in our personal space because you actually have to come. You have to get dressed. You have to come whether you feel like it or not. Can you guys imagine what would happen if you showed up here and I wasn't here and everyone's like, hey, where's the pastor? Oh, he's sleeping. He had, a, you know, he, he just wanted to sleep in this morning. You know what would happen? Because I know you guys. You guys would be like, well, we're here. Um, so let's just find out how we're doing. And you'd start sharing around the tables, start finding out how your week was. Maybe you'd start praying with each other, stuff, stuff people are going through. And you'd be thinking, well, God, let's pray for our pastor because he's a big flake. You know, he's not here. But on the same, t same hand, you guys would also be like, but maybe there's a role for us. And my whole goal here in, in, in sharing this story out of the Old Testament is that you would understand it was not just the prophet, it was not just the priest, it was not just the political leader, it was all the people that were going to build a place for the God to meet with his people. And because of the Holy Spirit, it's no longer limited to just one house, it's every house. And I love the fact that God started this church in a family room. We had to meet in family rooms when we first became your pastors because of gathering guidelines. But I feel like we're headed into a season where God is saying, I want you to meet in family rooms because that's how you're going to connect with people that don't like the church but do like you. So come September, we're going to actually have an opportunity to do that, to have some house, um, house churches for the month of September. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First Peter 2, 5 through 9 says this. This is who you are. This is talking about you. If you're in this room, can you raise your hand? <laughs> if you're not in this room, you should you just just it's okay. We love you. Um, but if you are in this room and you just raise your hand, you just said, This is for me. 
because this is for you. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a mobile house of God. Everywhere that you go, God is using you to bring his presence into that place where you wake, work, and worship. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is Peter, the apostle, writing this. He's reminding them then, and I'm reminding you now, that it's not just the Peters, and it's not just the Pauls, and it's not just the Johns. We are all the priesthood of the saints. You are all God's special people. You are the evidence of his presence in the world around us. And the enemy has loved the fact that we have limited the expression of a church to one tiny time slot on a Sunday morning. And that you have experienced Christian amnesia. That you have experienced a Christian concussion. And you've forgotten who you are the rest of the week. And I just want to remind you that in the same way where Kirk and Kim had to say, you know what, even though it's going to cost us something to open our doors, we believe God would use our house and our family room to to birth something because they understood this is true. I'm praying you would understand this is true too. You are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation for such a time as this. And there's people that you know that would never darken the door of a church but would definitely love to come over to your house for barbecue. And I can't wait to see when you grab a hold of them. And here's just a couple of examples of what happens through the Father's house, not on a Sunday morning. House youth, uh, we gather on Tuesdays, our junior high and our senior high. Um, Man, it's just been so amazing to see what God's doing there with our youth group. A lot of that actually happens around tables. Uh, Camille is very intentional about making sure that our youth connect not just around food and games, but also around the Word of God and praying for each other. Um, House of Young Adults, we just launched this a couple months ago, uh, and we meet in the Goods Home, because a lot of young adults really have a distaste for the church, but they are really hungry for authentic community. And so we gather at their house instead of here, and we're seeing new faces. Like we just had six new faces come to our, our young adults gathering this past Wednesday night. And God's really doing something there, and a lot of it happens around tables. Um, our growth groups that happen here usually on Tuesday nights, and, and we have men's and women's, sometimes it's combined. And again, that kind of growth and that connection to community happens around tables, our Moonlight worship nights. Why are, why are we doing that? Well, first of all, because it's summer and we want to be at the beach. But second of all, because maybe you can invite somebody that wouldn't come to church on a Tuesday night but would come to the beach. And, and who knows? I mean, just, just invite them and see what happens. But our goal is to be able to connect outside of the church to be reminded we are the church outside. Right? So I'd love to have you guys join me starting on July 11th. We're going to be walking through the Psalm of Ascents and, um, and worshiping out loud, in public, unashamed. And then we have our women's um, Ephesians growth group. Victoria has opened up her home to walk through the, the book of Ephesians because there's a lot of women with small children, and it's hard to find a small group that that's conducive to. And she specifically started this so that women uh, that are looking for something during the week or women with small children would have an opportunity to grow in community, and that happens around a table. Our men's life group happens every Thursday at the Ascend Coffee Company. I don't know if you guys, it's literally right across the parking lot here. Um, It's a a Christian-owned coffee company, and uh, we meet there every Thursday from 6.30 to 7.30. They turn the fire pit on for us. Really good coffee, really good food. But more importantly, it's an opportunity for us to journal together. And speaking of that, um, we have these life journals that at maybe one of your resolutions when you started out this year is, I'm going to spend every day in the Word of God together. How's it going for you? That's what I thought. So this is a great way to restart at the second half of 2023, to restart And say, you know what, God, I'm going to make the second half better than the first half, and I'm going to spend time with you and your word. And these journals are just a super simple tool to know what to read and how to process it as you walk through with the Lord. And we have free bookmarks for you as well on these metal tables. 
uh, July 1st, we started our brand new bookmark. And so that just gives you a little bit to read in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we all do it together. And then, if you don't want to come to our men's thing on 630, at 6.30 at Ascend Coffee, you can actually just start your own. How do you do that? Well, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, so I am giving you permission. No, in fact, I am encouraging you to start your own life group. You grab two of these, a Bible and a friend, and you pick where you're going to get together every single week. Now you have a life group. Can it be that simple? Yes. I can tell you from personal experience, life groups have changed my life because I consistently have a group of guys that are keeping me accountable to staying in the Word of God at least once a week. So grab some of these, grab some bookmarks, start a life group this week. And then we have our um, women that are uh, st- just our women's ministry, women of TFH, are, are, are providing all kinds of connection opportunities for you to be able to build community outside of an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday service. All of this is just examples of the fact that the body life of the church should never be limited to an hour and 15 minutes here, that God wants you to be intentional about connecting with those around you, and these are just some ways that you can do that. But there's lots more ways for you to connect, and so we're going to actually use one of those ways right now. You're going to see that question in the center of your table. What are some ways that you can show the love of Jesus in your circle of influence where you wake, work, and worship? So I want you to think about those three circles in your life. Where you wake up, that's your home, hopefully. Where you work, that's where you get a paycheck, hopefully. And where you worship, that's here or it's going to be at Moonlight Beach or maybe it's in the car while you're stuck in traffic and turn some worship on. Where you wake, work, and worship, you are an influence. And you're either going to be leading people towards the Lord or away from him. But either way, you're an influence in those three circles. And you are the center point in all of those circles. And I want you to think really practically now, how can I show the love of Jesus in those three places? If I truly am a royal priesthood, you can't have me go there because I I, I can't go to where you work all the time. It would be awkward for me to show up in the morning at your house. Super awkward. I'll I'll see you here where we worship, but the other circles are going to require you understanding your call to lead and connect people to Jesus through your own life in those places. So what I want you guys to do is just take a couple minutes around your table and talk through, just kind of dream out loud. What are some ways that we can show the love of Jesus in these three circles of influence? Maybe I'm going to invite somebody to my 4th of July barbecue. Maybe I'm going to show up because I've noticed my coworkers feeling super depressed Maybe I'm going to uh, pray for them, or I'm going to invite them to join me for lunch. Really practical ways that you can do that. Let's just take a couple of minutes to talk around the table. Just as well Thank you. 
conversation going on. I see some great conversations going on, and I certainly encourage you to carry them on after we're done. Um, but this is kind of the point about being around tables, is something can happen around a table that can't happen in rows. And so we would just really invite you to keep these conversations going. If, you, if this is your first time meeting the people at your table, you know, say, hey, let, let, let's go hang out um, and, and continue this conversation after church, get some fish tacos or something. Um, but I asked Barb, Barb and I were talking earlier today. By the way, this is Barbara Christensen. She is our head deacon and serves our leaders here. Can we just thank Barb for all that she does here at the Father's House? Barb, of course, is uh, Dan, Dan and Tracy. They're all family. They started this church together in the Hinson's home. And Barb has just been such a blessing to me, not only because uh, of what she speaks in terms of wisdom, but that she walks the talk. And we were talking through that kind of whole where you wake, work, and worship thing. And she had a story that I asked her if she would share with us. Yes. Um, where you wake, work, and worship, and where you get your hair cut and where you get your toes done. So sometimes I see men getting pedicures too, so they're not left out. But the Lord opened a really neat door for me. I walked into a hair salon for the first time, and I noticed um, two women with a Bible, and I knew they were part of a cult, teaching uh, the young, the owner's son. So that was a real concern for me to walk in and seeing that, and I felt like the Lord was saying, bring light into this darkness. And how do I do that, Jesus? I do that by praying and waiting for the opportunity and being bold to go through the door that he opens. So it took a while. I was praying for some time for this family, became friends with the owner, and I got the, up the boldness to ask her if she wanted me to start a Bible study with her and her coworkers. And she said yes. So it was one year of teaching the Bible to these women, and it was really exciting because um, they were people that had never heard the stories in the Bible, believe it or not. So it was like such a refreshing, as a t Bible teacher, to be able to share the stories of the Bible and to see them come alive. Got them Bibles, spent a whole year with them, and it really was a glorious experience. And then her, the one son came to our youth camp, and then her two little sons were supposed to be coming to the summer thing. I don't know if they ended up making it or not. But also to share with the nail place. You know, it's usually Vietnamese, which is fine. That's their business. That they, They've kind of taken over that business, which is great. There's a language barrier. So you don't always accept, for me, I shouldn't speak for you, but normally I'm looking at my phone, I'm looking at a magazine, because that language barrier, I don't know that I can really communicate that well. Well, the Lord said, put your phone down, put your magazine down, and connect with this woman who Christ died for. And so now I have a friendship with Tao, who actually came to my house for tea. And so it's the beginning of a relationship with Tao. I don't know where it's going to lead. She talks about being a Buddhist. I talk about being a Christian. But I think there is nothing more exciting than being an ambassador for Christ. That's what we're called to do, to share the love of Jesus. The Great Commission, we need to remember the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And sharing the word of God with people that come into our, our, our influence. And um, so that is really my heart. And I'm glad to share this with you because it's really what God has called us to do out of darkness into his glorious light and be lights for Christ, be light bearers. We can't bring light, but we have this treasure in this earthen vessel, and it's the treasure of Jesus Christ in us. We can share and bring the power of Christ because of who he is and what he's done. A total stranger led me to Christ that came to my door from Campus Crusade for Christ. Bill Bright says this, Show me a Christian that continually shares their faith, and I will show you a Christian that's filled with joy. And I believe that's true. Out of my heart for what Christ did for me and my family, one right after the other were saved in our family. I was the first one saved by a total stranger. The Lord swept through our family that year, and I want to give him glory. What can I give the Lord? 
for what he's done for me. I'm going to lift up the cup of salvation. That's what the Bible tells us. Would you guys just stand right where you're at? As, as Barb was just speaking, I just felt like the Lord just wants to remind you, you are a man or woman on assignment. There is a reason why you're here. By his spirit, he wants to bring back your spiritual memory where maybe you've experienced a Christian concussion and you've forgotten why you're here. And God wants to remind you of that. So I want you guys to put your hands out like you're about to receive something because in the same way the spirit of the Lord stirred up the hearts of the people and they put that into action and obedience. We have been reminded in a powerful way that at this halfway point of 2023, we are here on purpose. And it's so much more than just sitting in a chair on a Sunday morning. You are the church where you wake, work, and worship. Barb, would you just pray that over us this morning? Yeah, I just want to say there's 250 remembers in the word of God. And there's one scripture that says we willfully forget and Father, I pray in, in the name of Jesus that you would forgive us for willfully forgetting the Great Commission, <laughs> willfully forgetting that we're supposed to share the love of Jesus because we get so caught up with our own lives. Father, I pray that you would help us. That one scripture in Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And it goes on to say, Then I will teach transgressors thy way, and sinners will be converted to me. So, Father, I pray that we would have clean hearts. We would be filled with the Holy Spirit. We would be diligent to share the faith and be so thankful for what you did, pulling us out of the kingdom of darkness and translating us into the kingdom of light. I pray for every person here, Lord Jesus, that you would cause us to remember we're ambassadors for Christ as though God were begging through our lives, be reconciled to God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for coming here today. Just understand as you go from this place, you go in the freedom that God has brought you today that this world is hungry for. Thank you guys so much for coming. Next Sunday, we'll go into the third room, the kitchen. Until then, God bless you guys. Have a happy 4th of July.